vaccine, as impossible as that may seem right now, is only the first step. Remember, this is something that's going to have to be injected, or somehow delivered, to most of the world's population. If we get it wrong, we could turn a catastrophe into a medical apocalypse. You get one shot and one shot only. You get one opportunity here if you create something that isn't safe and it sickens people, getting people to go for the next vaccine will be next to impossible. To achieve the impossible, both in the time frame the politicians are promising and to ensure the safety of the vaccine, some, like Professor Kaplan, are advocating a radical and highly risky strategy, deliberately infecting healthy volunteers to determine if the vaccine works. It's called a challenge study, and it's rarely been done in medical history. If you immunize people and then deliberately give them the virus, deliberately, you infect them, pick people who are young and very unlikely to die, then you know and you get an answer. We have, uh, uh, if you will, a setup to speed up by months, if not years, the ability to find that vaccine. If you deliberately infect people, though, without having a, a rescue clause, that does raise huge ethical questions, doesn't it? It does. Now, you have to do what you can to minimize the risk. And they'd also have to know that uh, if they got sick, there is a chance, uh, it's a small one, but a chance they could die. That's a, a very big if. Do you, do you know many of these people? Right now, there's a website that started to ask for volunteers for challenge studies. I do think the problem is not going to be getting the volunteers, it's going to be making the decision that it's ethical to do this. There is one famous Australian scientist who did deliberately infect a healthy human to test a cure. The lab in Wuhan, for example, what category? Well, it'd be at least PC3. Professor Barry Marshall gave himself the stomach bacteria that causes fatal ulcers. Not only did he survive, but he won the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 2005. I said to my wife, oh, you know, we were right. And she said, what? I said, I took the bacteria, I've got the illness. And she said, you did what? So I did do it myself in, in a time when the, there wasn't so much technology and so much thought about it. But when you did it, when you infected yourself, mm. did you have a rescue strategy? A little bit. A little bit. It wasn't, my rescue strategy was not perfect. I know that with hindsight. And, and you're obviously in a high risk class for COVID-19, but if we could wind back the clock and you could take part in such a study, would you put your hand up? Immediately. If we did have such a study and deliberately infect those people, how much more would that help? I think you could speed the process by anywhere from six months to a couple of years, because remember, you're talking about tens and tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people dying over that period of time. That's again why I think it might be a trade-off if people were willing to volunteer to be subjects. I think it's time, given this enormous plague and the damage it's causing and the deaths it's causing to look for that kind of heroism again. In a sense, the world doesn't have a choice. The question can't be if we find a vaccine, but when, no matter how many billions of dollars and man hours it takes. If we don't, we face a future of lockdowns, social distancing and recurring COVID pandemics for years if not decades to come. And if it's not your company that comes up with this, but another company, but there is a vaccine, will you still be happy? Yes, because it won't be the fact of one single company. We need many solutions, as many solutions as we can get, because nobody can produce enough to uh, supply the world, nobody. So I wish that um, there's a vaccine that gets to the market as quickly as possible, even if it's not ours. Professor Kaplan, you're not painting a very rosy picture, not sounding terribly optimistic about a vaccine. Well, politicians, whether it's in the USA, the UK, uh, Australia, other countries, you know, they want to be optimistic. 
telling people to lock themselves up for a year and a half while we try to wait this thing out is probably impossible, and they know that. So they quickly turn to talk of vaccines and magic bullets as a way to give us hope. I'm not against hope, but when you talk about vaccinating the world in 12 months, I think you're fantasizing. Hello, I'm Sarah Arbo. Thanks for watching. To keep up with the latest from 60 Minutes Australia, make sure you subscribe to our channel. You can also download the Nine Now app for full episodes and other exclusive 60 Minutes content. I was recently having a conversation with someone who told me that he had read a book in which it argued that because of the way that humanity is destroying the planet, wreaking such destruction on nature, that the only way for a human being to be ethical in this modern world is to kill himself or herself. So to commit suicide is the only way to be ethical in this modern world. And I so profoundly do not agree with that. Interestingly, over time, especially on my video about why I think it's a bad idea for people to have children, people have commented, I think maybe five, six, seven times over the past several years, oh, if you believe that, you should just kill yourself. That would be the best service you could do to humanity. And they say it in sort of a snarky way. However, this person who was telling me about this book said the author argued it in an actually serious way. So I want to reply to it once and for all. Why do I think it's a terrible idea to commit suicide? Why do I think committing suicide is not an ethical thing in this modern world? Now I can understand in part the argument that if there's one less human, that's one less person eating plants, eating animals, living in space, the space of our planet, using water, using other resources, electricity. So I can't understand the argument of removing a human actually could have some positive effect. But to me, that doesn't at all negate the horrible side of what happens when someone does commit suicide. And that's why I think it's never ethical to commit suicide. Suicide causes trauma. In all the people who know the person, or maybe not everybody, but people who are close to that person, suicide, suicide is a devastating thing. I've actually had friends commit suicide. One of my parents at one point when I was younger th just threatened to commit suicide. And that in and of itself was horrible for me. I remember having bad dreams about it for a long time. It's an overwhelming feeling of powerlessness, of helplessness, sometimes of guilt. It really does create a ripple effect of trauma. And that's why I would never argue that it's an ethical thing, especially for the sake of healing the world, of making the world a better place for people to kill themselves. So what is the ethical thing to do? <laughs> to help heal this world, this pain, troubled, confused world, this world in which humanity is over-exploiting resources, over-exploiting each other, parents so often are exploiting their children. We're eating ourselves out of house and home. People can even say that we're like a cancer or a virus spreading across the planet. And unfortunately, I've been to some places where it sure does seem that way. And I live in New York City. This county that I live in of Manhattan, I think it's the most densely packed county in the whole United States. One of the most densely packed places in the whole world. In some ways, it is like being in the center of living in the tumor of the cancer. But what is the ethical thing to do? living in this world. Well, I do think not having children really, there's some really good arguments why that's ethical, not creating a new life. It doesn't cause trauma to not create a new life. To take away a life, that does cause trauma. So that's one thing to not have children. But I really think underneath it, whether someone even has children or not, the main thing is to heal our own individual traumas to unblock our spirit, to let the truth of ourselves come out freely, the truth of what we weren't allowed when we were children, especially in our family systems that didn't totally allow us to be who we really are, or in some cases profoundly didn't allow us to be who we really are, to heal these traumas, to grieve. This, to me, is what humanity is hinging upon, the health, the future of our humanity. If individual people can grieve, that does the opposite of sending out a trauma into the world, the opposite of what happens when someone kills themselves. 
When people start to grieve, when an individual starts to heal his or her trauma, starts to become more real, starts to become more honest, starts to become more healthy, more integrated, more of a whole human being, a more caring person, a more altruistic person, a more empathic person, all these things being a consequence of healing historical traumas. When people become more of these things, when people become healthier, it spreads. A ripple happens. It affects everyone that is close to him or her. Now, what I have seen also, I've seen this in my personal life and I've seen this with others, is not infrequently when people start to get healthier, when people start to work out their traumas, when people have more of their true spirit come out, when they become more honest.